The uh, next speaker is someone I've known for seven years. I met Vi in 2010. Um, so Vi Hart is, uh, so uh, some of you probably remember 1963, the Beatles, Beatlemania. Everyone went crazy, like, oh my gosh, like I just want to like buy the mugs. And so basically what happened in, starting in 2010 is Vi, uh, right out of school, started making these videos on YouTube. And these videos just went super viral, like millions and millions of people watching them. And two interesting things about these videos, the people watching them were kids, like 10-year-old kids, and the videos were about math. And basically, she had so much fun, and she created these beautiful visions of how much fun math is as a, just a, a joyous, fun activity and explorative and ideas and she tied it together with music um, that I, I think she just basically turned in an entire generation of kids into loving math. And this was like a single person just doing this with the power of her ability to kind of use this emerging new medium of I'm making a video and it's reaching a new audience. And since since then, I mean, she's she's been the person who made inspiring videos at Khan Academy. Uh, now she's been um, she's been spending the last few years, and I think you'll show a bunch of that stuff, leading um, a phenomenal um, group of creating virtual reality extensions of these ideas and new ideas. So you're you're really seeing, I think, one of one of the great minds. I don't want to embarrass you, but it's like the way I think of I. She's not only a good friend, but she's somebody like I, I totally look up to and and in awe of. So um, I think I've embarrassed you enough. Uh, by heart. <laughs> Um, thank you for that extremely kind introduction. I'm just going to get my computer and stuff set up here. So, hi, I'm Vi Hart. Um, first, I want to get a feel. You are not quite my usual audience. Usually, uh, people specifically are at a conference related to some project that I, I do. So, um, who here knows who I am in any capacity? Few people. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I run this research group, Ella VR. We do basic research for AR, VR, MR, whatever we call it, which will eventually just be reality. Um, and we're really focusing on how this will let us think in new ways, the same way the technology of reading and writing and the written word helped us think in new ways. Um, and, and we're thinking like on a thousands of year time scale uh, with the development of technology. Um, okay, so that's, that's my VR work. Um, I've also done uh, some other work. Is anyone familiar with this? A few people? Okay. And how about YouTube videos? Um, I've made some YouTube videos, as Ken mentioned. Um, who has seen any of these? Oh, okay. Some, some of you. Uh, okay. And then before that, I actually did uh, not start the video straight out of school. I spent a couple years running around doing computational geometry and giving talks and writing papers and doing <coughs> tutorials about math stuff. Um, and then I hit on the videos a couple years into that process and they turned out to be much more successful than the previous stuff. Okay, so yeah, so those are my, those are like my several lives. Um, and every audience has like a different, what they, what they have known about. So I'm gonna just, this is a talk about how I talk to myself and how my team talks with each other and how we think when we talk and communicate with ourselves and with others. So I'm going to start just by playing one of these uh, videos that I made six or seven years ago um, as an example of me mostly trying to capture my own thought process, make a video that isn't technologically great, it's fuzzy, the camera's terrible, it's certainly not an example of beautiful technique for video making as it was understood at the time. Um, but it captures a thought process and, and that to me is what I'm trying to get at, is the way of thinking. So uh, here, snakes. Snakes. Lots and lots of snakes. These snakes are just writhing with potential, similar parts linked together. They move in a specific and limited way. Part of the potential of things is how they break. These snakes break fantastically into these snake modules. You can put them back together too, allowing the existence of the super snake. 
Super snakes are obviously desirable for many reasons. Besides being inherently awesome, you can wear them and put them on things and drop them, which I find amusing for some reason. You can arrange them into a space-filling fractal curve if, if that's what you like, which I do. You can even jump snake. But let's not forget you can make mini snakes too, which enables the snake stash, and starting from mini snake gives you room to grow. Snake, 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 snake. They like to bend into this angle. Who cares what it actually is besides about 90 degrees? But it begs the question, how many ways can I fold this snake if it has 10 segments? I can notate the way it slithers back and forth from tail to head, left, right, right, left, left, right, left. I'm going to call this string of letters a slither. This is a valid slither. This is an invalid one, since anyone who's played snake knows that a snake isn't allowed to run into itself. Given a slither, how can I tell whether it's... Of course, snake lets you go straight, too, so you can do another version of this that allows going straight and notate it like this and wonder whether this snake is a loser snake or not. Snake, 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 snake. Don't forget to try putting the snake modules together in ways they were never meant to go. You can mix colors, so in theory, I could be hiding a secret message in the color pattern of this snake. But I'm not because I'm lazy, so it's just the digits of the binary expansion of pi. Even better, you can attach more than one segment at a point, I can have a two-headed serpent, I can play the game where I cut off the heads of a hydra, adding two more in the old head's place, and see how far that gets me. I can put the snake modules on my fingertips and have sneaky fingers. That's cool too. I can even do super sneaky fingers. Snake, 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 snake. Snake, 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 snake. Snake, 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 snake. Snake, 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 snake. So, what I wanted to capture in these videos, I didn't think I was making these for kids. It turns out that kids like math, and like, why shouldn't they, uh, if no one teaches them not to. Um, I, made, uh, I started making these videos because I thought uh, my audience was the people I went to math conferences with. Uh, and when we meet around the table at the math conference, we're just having fun, we're playing with things, we're drawing on the table at the restaurant, on the paper, and, you know, just having fun and exploring things. And that this thought process, you know, some of it has this rigorous part where you notice a way to notate and capture something, and you can do something with that. And part of it is uh, things that aren't math, you're just connecting things in different ways, and that this is part of the same exploratory process. You don't need to say, this part is serious math, we're doing math now, um, it's just this fun exploration. And so this was an honest capturing of that kind of thinking, rather than trying to teach and communicate and like make kids like math. You don't have to make anyone like math. It's inherently beautiful and interesting. You can only like ruin it by accidentally trying to like basically um, lie about what it is. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and it, oh, so VR. Yeah, my group does VR. Um, so we made the we we started in 2014. I was thinking, okay, well, VR video is going to be a thing. It doesn't really exist yet, but I make video. VR video is going to be a thing. I want to make sure I have some influence in what that landscape is going to look like. So in 2014, we started making VR video. We made the first web player for VR video and, you know, demoed it to Google. And now they have a, a YouTube player, so we don't have to, like, write all our own stuff for everything anymore, which is great. Um, and we did some early work in web VR. Uh, so we're very web-focused. Um, most of what we do is a website you go to in your headset rather than an app you download. Um, and more recently, we, yeah, the math always comes back because it's beautiful and fun now instead of just thinking about hyperbolic space, this beautiful innovation in, in like understanding of mathematics. Uh, we can be in hyperbolic space. The computer doesn't know that space is Euclidean. The computer doesn't know space is three-dimensional. The computer just doesn't know what reality is. We can tell it whatever laws of physics we want. We can tell it whatever laws of space-time we want. Uh, so we can walk around in hyperbolic space if we want, if we program that, uh, which we did, um, which was in nature recently, so that's fun. Um, and we're also working on what is the working environment that's going to let us collaborate and think and work effectively. Um, I think this whole keyboard thing on the laptop where you type like this and then you're mousing around and then your wrists hurt and then you can't work all day anymore after you're in your early 20s, I just think that's such a tragedy and we're losing so much of our potential by the fact that we can't just work seamlessly without our bodies kind of betraying us. Um, so we've been kind of looking at what will the workspace look like, what will our collaborative spaces look like, 
when we're freed from this thing we do and have all our bodies and when we're comfortable. So we have this office of the future. It exists virtually. My team meets there regularly. Um, at, at the moment, it looks like this. This is our like main office. Um, <laughs> it's been dubbed VR kindergarten because we're becoming children again, playing on the floor. Um, and assuming different positions, we can work by uh, doing natural motions kind of in this range that we call like the hug zone. Only occasionally do you want to like reach out and do like fancy things. You can't do that all day, you can do it sometimes. So you want the less common actions to be over here. And generally you want to be uh, gesturing in the space you would normally gesture in when you're, when you're communicating and talking. So we can capture that now. We don't, we don't need to like be stuck in these unnatural positions when we type and click our mouses around. Um, so yeah, there's, there's our deskless office, um, and we've been working on things like what our programming language is going to look like when we take our bits of code and we can grab them and put them together uh, without you know, typing um, everything and, and what that's going to enable when we're thinking less linearly about code coming down a page but instead can have all our bits of code everywhere. Oh, and this function I put it over here, and oh, what was that? Oh, I think it was over here. Okay, yes. Ah, here's my code. Okay, I wanted to tweak this. All right, we'll put that back over there. So we're thinking very spatially about uh, what we can do when we're no longer constrained by this thing with its flat screen. Uh, and yeah, four-dimensional stuff because, you know, math, you got a math, the computer doesn't know it's not four-dimensional, you just program it in and you have four-dimensional live rendered on the web uh, monkeys, you know, because you can. Um, so, but I wanted to kind of tell a, a story here um, about why the VR stuff connects to the previous work um, in many areas. Um, and it has to do with these methods of thinking and these beautiful things that we're trying to get at. Um, like, for example, the Borromean rings. Um, I did some work on computational balloon twisting to find efficient ways of twisting balloons into, into various shapes. It turns out to be a graph theory problem. Uh, theoretical computer science problem. Um, but the Borromean rings that I learned about in conferences I went to as a child, uh, they can be made out of balloons. Um, and they can be made out of onion rings. Uh, I did a, this is a still from a video that I made to kind of share with the public the joy of Borromean rings by making Borromean onion rings. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that, that went into my video work. Um, and also now in my uh, virtual reality work. So this is a uh, Venn diagram um, museum that we made um, here where taking advantage of the fact that the laws of physics are different, um, we can grab this delicate looking piece that lets us um, kind of switch the crossings on loops and knots uh, to start to get at the basic ideas around knot theory where if you change a crossing over or under, you can change something from being a knot or two links from being linked to not being linked. Um, and this is something that when we talk about topology and mathematics, we're visualizing this in our head. But we shouldn't have to rely on building all the knowledge to visualize this in our head um, that we have to do so artificially right now. We should just be able to grab the thing, poke it, see it right in front of us, and then get that visualization into our head much more quickly. So here the question is with this thing, there's different ways the crossing can go under and over, and um, how many ways does this end up being a trefoil knot, and how many ways could it just unravel into a loop? And now that we can do this in front of us with our hands, um, and it's a museum, you can't break anything, you can make infinite amount of these things, uh, we can get that, that kind of mathematical concept into our heads without you know, needing to use real materials and, and doing all the extra work of visualization. Okay, so get rid of that. Um, where am I? I'm gonna go back here. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're gonna start the story here. Um, I grew up in a dome. Um, this dome I did not make myself. This one I did. Um, I had Zone Tool, which is this wonderful thing. Other kids had Legos. I had Zone Tool, this great geometric tool for building uh, shapes such as this. Um, and I remember when I made this, I felt like really clever about eating an apple inside this dome because I wasn't just uh, building these structures and then you like to put your head in them because that's like a human instinct. You want to be inside of big math sculptures. Maybe that's a human instinct. It is for me. Uh, I, I was living in it, right? I was being there. I was eating an apple. I wasn't just there for dome's sake. I was, you know, I was immersed. Um, 
And, you know, this, this continued. There I am, like, I don't know, 13 or something. And then, you know, 19 or whenever that was, 17. Um, so, uh, I went to these conferences then. Um, when I was a teenager, I was lucky enough that my father would go to these cool math and computer science conferences, and he would come back and be so excited about how cool they were. And I said, I just, I'm miserable in school. Everything's awful and boring, and everybody sucks. So please take me to these conferences. They seem really cool. And I was lucky enough that he did, and I was allowed to tag along. And and I was introduced to this world where like people were interesting and people were doing interesting things. And they weren't like my classmates in in middle school. They were doing just incredible stuff. And um, this is a conference gathering for Gardner uh, in honor of Martin Gardner. And we had this sculpture party, and we all built, um, all these sculptures were built over the years by conference participants at workshops, and it was very hands-on, and everyone's happy, and it was just like the best thing, and it was just those like couple weeks of the year where I got to go to these conferences in the summer, like that was what I lived for, everything else just seemed terrible, and that, that idea that there's this world out there full of beauty and wonder, uh, that, really, that really kept me going. And I wanted to participate. I wanted to do that. I wanted to be that. So I did. Um, yeah, more pictures. And so I started giving workshops at these uh, conferences, um, at first with the emphasis on, well, I need like, low-cost light materials. Like, I'm not going like, to ship in the giant pile of laser-cut, water-jet-cut metal. Um, but I, I could do balloons. We can make something out of balloons, right? That's, you know, easy. You can pack it in your carry-on and then just, like, inflate them. Um, so we, uh, I, I, at the next gathering for Gardner I went to, I, I did a workshop where we made a big geometric sculpture out of balloons. Um, and it turned out there were some really interesting, that's a hyperbolic tiling, uh, there are some interesting theoretical questions regarding the balloons. And, um, yeah, so there they are. Um, we got a nice paper out of it. Um, so that's like the computationally efficient icosahedron made with just six balloons because that was, it's, it is though, like it's, it's fun stuff. Um, made out of just one balloon because you can do that with this kind of shape because, you know, it has vertices of even degree. Um, and, and so that was, that was kind of what happened before the, the video work. Um, yeah, and it's, it's like got real math in it, so that's fun. Um, and so those were the workshops. And meanwhile, I was getting a music degree uh, because a music degree seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and so that's, that's that. Uh, and then after I graduated, um, yeah, spent, spent a couple years kind of figuring out what to do with my life because I had this weird skill set that didn't seem useful. So this is an art piece where we made paper instruments. Um, yeah, instruments out of working instruments out of paper, uh, and then play them while they were on fire. So like that was the first video I uploaded to YouTube in 2009 was of playing instruments while they're on fire, uh, and and then other musical things because I was I was a composer at that point, um, a, a Mobius music box that plays music and then as it goes around it loops except it's upside down so you get a different a different sound. Uh, so those were the first videos I uploaded to YouTube were of this other recreational work um, and gave more talks at conferences. Um, but a fractal can be made out of balloons like that. It can be made out of candy corn and put it in a video. Um, I was blogging about uh, how-tos, about how you can do math at home using your own material. You can cut your cantaloupe into a dodecahedron as a nice centerpiece. Uh, so this is a blog at this point. Um, all right, there's these great mathematical ideas that if you have a cube and if you cut a cube in half just right, um, you get a hexagon, which is kind of surprising. You have to kind of hold it up by the, uh, by the corners and cut kind of between. Um, but a straight cut can get you this, this hexagon. Uh, so, of course, you want to cut an apple in half, and for that you need a cube apple, and you might as well make other fruit shapes. Um, so that's what I was doing at the time, hyperbolic planes. Um, and all these, these concepts came back then in my video work and then in virtual reality because they're beautiful concepts. And I want to have this dialogue with myself. With myself. I want to understand these ideas. And when VR started becoming uh, relatively inexpensive and easy to work with, uh, it was just always natural that we can have these things appear in front of our faces and disobey the laws of physics and space-time and like, be real-time. Uh, manipulable with my hands and all these ideas and things I had to imagine in my head as a mathematician, I could now just put in front of my face and it's just magical. So 
this is, yeah, this is hyperbolic stuff. Um, and more hyperbolic stuff. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna kind of skip over this. I also, by the way, have no idea how I am on time, but we'll just keep going until <laughs> someone tells me to stop. Um, <laughs> right. So I had you know a tutorial how to make a beadwork hyperbolic plane. If you want the seven three tiling, this is how you do it. Um, but and then maybe I want bigger beads, plastic beads, right? Uh, maybe I want the beads to be even bigger and more inexpensive. Uh, so I made beads out of plastic bottles. So I could have these giant plastic bottle beads and make things bigger. Um, now, of course, I have the most inexpensive, easily replicable material of all, and that is virtual reality, where I can just make a shape, and then I can duplicate it as easily as going like that, and then I can arrange them however I want, or I can program them to arrange themselves. And I just have infinite material, and it's so freeing to not have to worry about cost, or about weight, or about gravity if I don't want to, or I can make gravity if I want to worry about gravity. It's just all there in front of me. Uh, so, yeah, hyperbolic planes. Um, I was artist in residence for a bit at Harvard, and I made quite a mess in one of their uh, dorm dining halls. Um, we, we made sculptures out of... Uh, dollar store material, right? At, you can get a dollar store laundry basket, just get a giant pile of them. Someone had the idea, oh, we have this giant hyperbolic plane made out of umbrellas. Uh, let's get some whiteboard markers and we'll write poetry on them and just interact and communicate. And that's the kind of talking to yourself that I like to do. It's <laughs> conversing with materials and using um, the embodied knowledge of how to converse with materials with your hands that doesn't often get acknowledged as being a kind of knowledge because it's really difficult to capture. We know how to capture words really well. We know how to have computers deal with words really well um, and do artificial intelligence with, with written text. Uh, but all this other stuff, we only just now are beginning to be able to capture, like this, this ability to make stuff with our hands and know where things are and reach for objects we want without even looking. Um, it's magic that we can do these things, but now that we can capture them, it's going to just open up a whole new way of being able to think to ourselves as well as communicate with others. And that's going to make us be able to have some powerful ideas. Okay, so there's some video stuff. Um, can I mostly skip over that? That's when the videos happened. Um, and then I got to the virtual reality because, hey, if, if, if there's going to be a video stuff for VR, like I want to get in on that as early as possible. I want to influence it to be good so that by the time it's a medium everyone's using, uh, it's not terrible. <laughs> so the, the, for our first um, test, uh, I was thinking, oh, well, we're going to have this like, first-person perspective because uh, my videos try and take this dialogue you're saying to yourself and make you feel as if you, you were doing this thought process. So I thought, how cool would it be if you can just have this video and you look down um, and, you know, I'm, I'm you know, doing the doodling or doing hexaflexagons or whatever I'm doing, uh, and you can look down and all your mirror neurons can, like, feel that as if you were doing it yourself but in virtual reality. So that was the initial stuff we started to play with. Um, but at that time in 2014, there was no like way to make this stuff without um, kind of figuring out how to do it yourself. We had to build the cameras. We had to build the theory behind how footage gets, gets stitched together in various ways and the mathematics behind how, to, um, like how stereospherical video worked. Um, some people had kind of hacked stuff together in the industry. No one understood really how it worked. Um, there were companies making things that were just mathematically unsound, so uh, we dug into that and um, we did, yep, yeah, virtual reality camera work. Um, our first work uh, we did, we filmed in the Botanical Gardens in SF, and it was designed so that uh, we had this like astroturf thing set up so that you're supposed to lie on your back and look up at the sky and you're seeing like the trees wave and the sun being filtered through the trees and you're just relaxing. Uh, instead of, we wanted to get away from like the forward-facing bias where you're supposed to just look in one direction. And people have tried lots of clever things about how to get people to actually look around. And we said, well, maybe we don't need people to be like looking all around them like this. Maybe it would be wonderful if people could just lie on their back and look up at the sky and relax in like a corner of their office that's been set up for this. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was some of our first stuff in 2014. Um, another way to solve the problem of People like, want to look around at everything, and they're worried they're going to miss something behind them, especially people new to VR. So we created a GIF. Um, it's a stop-motion anima animation of 12 frames, and you don't worry you're missing anything because it all loops, and you can kind of spend as long as you want looking around you. So we created a video player, and that was just because we needed a video player. It wasn't because we wanted to invent the future of platforms, um, but it turned out that like that 
but this is a thing people were very interested in. Uh, but that's kind of a side effect, an artifact of trying to like create these works that are a dialogue with ourselves and with each other. Um, so we played with editing techniques for a while. Oh, okay, I have this one extra minute for intersectional feminism minute. This is usually in the middle of my talk, but I guess uh, I'm already starting to get to the end. Um, every talk I give should have one of these minutes, I think. So for the past year, I've been doing that. Um, so I've worked in mathematics, in uh, computational geometry, and theoretical computer science. Uh, now I work in virtual reality and like kind of in the Silicon Valley startup world. Um, and there's this kind of weird effect where um, sometimes people think you're not ambitious if you're not trying to like CEO of a big company or have metrics, like really high metrics, like I could be trying to get more views on YouTube or like being super famous or whatever, and I just like to hide in my nonprofit research corner with my team and like try and invent like the future 2,000 years from now. Um, like I, I'm kind of too ambitious to spend my time kind of dealing with some of the stuff you have to deal with if you get to in the industry where people kind of expect you to constantly prove yourself and that can cause a lot of extra time when people come in with a certain expectation that you should prove yourself because you're different than what they usually see in the industry. So that's intersectional feminism minute about ambition. Um, okay, so we created a lot more work and I'm almost out of time. We started mixing um, uh, video and VR video with uh, live animated uh, spatial stuff. So we have these characters that are live rendered spatially so you can move around and also this video. Um, so we started combining that and then we really just got more interested in like being able to move around and use all your bodies and the hand tracking started to come out. Um, this is going to be a story that I'm not going to tell because basically yeah, I took a web page I made in 2000 and well 2000 actually. Um, and you know, tried to like get back to my childhood and that freedom I felt making a web page when I was 11, um, and uh, make that in virtual reality, which meant I had to create like a bootstrapping tool so that I could draw and create that aesthetic of hand-drawn stuff. So we created a drawing app as soon as the Vive hand controllers came out, just so that I could use this hand-drawing app to make the Toto and Clem uh, hand-drawn thing, so I could ha I could have it look ugly instead of pretty, and then put that in my my VR web page. And then as long as I was there, I had like these peach earrings and we did multi-sensory experiences and like made a, yeah, using that tool to talk to myself and uh, to a live streamed audience to live program all sorts of things while I demonstrate the math by drawing in the air. So that's, uh, that was a project. And then we can decorate a cake by shooting peach earrings at it in VR. So yeah, <laughs> that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you.